Well, look, for the next wee while, and in many ways, this guy this guy was one of the first people I interviewed before we were even on air at the platform. I went down to that crazy protest at Parliament to try and get a feel for what was going on, the platform commissioned a survey. And I looked at one of my old haunts, the backbencher pub, and I saw them, uh, the protesters running a sort of, I don't know, a clothing exchange thing there in the loading bay at the back bencher, a place where I'd normally just have a cigarette with Winston Peters. And I popped in to see Boise, the publican I've known for a while. We had a talk about it, did an interview with Boise, which kind of went viral almost. So he's been with the platform um, from the beginning. He is, is one of our Free Speech Friday commentators. And he was actually my host yesterday after the a funeral of a, a very, very old colleague, John Armstrong, former political editor of the New Zealand Herald. And uh, a fair few of us, much longer in the tooth than we were, went to the back benches for the odd bevy. And uh, he joins us now to wrap up his year and look back at the weird and wonderful year that was 2022. Boise, Alistair Boyce from the Backbencher Pub in Wellington. Boise, how are you, mate? I'm good. Good to be with you. Look, busy last night. Did you kick on? Oh, uh, no, it, it dies out about um, sort of 8 o'clock. Yeah. Um, but we had, we had a good few drinkers in. It was nice to see your group. Yeah. All yeah. the old Junos. And uh, we had uh, quite a few of our regulars there. And uh, my business partner was there. And it was uh, not a bad little shindig for a Monday before Christmas. Yeah. Um, Boise, geez, you've had a year, mate. You really have. Um, yeah, it's, it's been exciting, Sean. It has been uh, enthralling and invigorating. Um, due to the platform, I've uh, resumed my writing career, and you kindly uh, you kindly publish my works. Yeah. And I'm sure I'll be able to, over the summer break, uh, furnish you with some more. I'm working on a couple right now. Oh, good stuff. Uh, so, good yeah, stuff. The, well, what struck me, Boise, we were, I was down the end to look at the, at the protests, and you had... The politicians, and I hate to see it, say it, the mainstream media are on one side. And then you had all these, not crazy people, but this incredible mixture of people out on the lawn and a fair amount of chaos. And I thought, who is the person closest to this who isn't kind of involved? And it was you, actually, because your business right at the epicentre of yep. the protest. And you didn't choose to be there, but you couldn't pick up the pub and move it, could you? Looking no. back, I mean, how big a deal was that? And how weird was that when you look back with, what, eight, nine months um, perspective on it? Uh, it was surreal. It was exhilarating. It was this mammoth expression of direct democracy right in front of me. It was a, a huge crowd, a torrent of people who had a lot of pent-up anger. They'd been promised um, that there would be no consequences for not getting vaccinated. As per your survey, it was 95% um, unvaccinated. Um, so there was a lot of COVID out there and in there. Um, and looking back on it, it, it was, um, yeah, the, I, I wouldn't have missed it for the world in a way because it, was a, it will become a defining event um, for, for the for the history, the political history of New Zealand, uh, more so possibly than the uh, Springbok tour. And Boise, you offered the pub as a neutral venue for the parties to come and talk, and also you expressed some disquiet that they had sort of co-opted some of your premises, and when you asked them to clear out, they did, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, no, there was a lot. Um, the main part of the protest was reasonable people who'd been driven um, to, the, to the edge. Uh, they'd lost, a lot of them had lost their jobs, their livelihoods, their houses. Uh, they'd lost their place and status in society, uh, courtesy of the government mandates. And, I would also uh, argue, Boyce, a lot of them never had jobs or status in society. They were already outsiders. Yeah, well, that, that was another um, part of the protest where they wanted to maintain the protest to maintain the point. So they had all the free food going on, so they welcomed anyone. Like, it became a community that were So all the homeless came in, of course, because they had um, free shelter. There were free tents. Um, there was a lot of money poured into it from a lot of business people who uh, were very anti the government and what the government had uh, been destroying whole whole parts of the economy. Um, so it wasn't quite what it seemed, and, and that was a clear strategy to keep the numbers up, to keep the bulk of the people there. So all the homeless people from around Wellington 
um, uh, were actually welcomed into the community and, and made feel part of it. But uh, of course, they brought a lot of social problems with them. Who um, ran and it? There was, well, boys here, who funded it? We still haven't was, got an answer to that question. <laughs> I'm not going to give you the names, but I, I, I did meet a lot of the people who funded it, um, and they're normal people like you and me. Uh, were they really, Boise? Why aren't you going to tell us who they were? Why were they operating <laughs> in the shadows? But, well, because um, part of the process when I was trying to be an intermediary between the police and the protest organisers um, I, I have to retain confidences uh, in any anything like that, just as you would in business, just as you would in any negotiation or any sort of um, way of bringing parties together in a situation that involves police. And, and at one point, they were trying to drag the army into it. Like um, that was when it was starting to get really out of control. Um, so yeah, the people involved, uh, unless they want to come out and talk to you, and some of them probably would, uh, in retrospect as time goes on, um, it, they're entitled to their anonymity. I'm not going to be the one that, that breaks it because I was in a position of confidence with them. And for me to um, uh, sort of bring the police and them together to try and get resolution, uh, it was really, really important to maintain the highest level of confidence that I could, and that uh, I'll maintain that to this day um, mm. and going forward, unless they choose to break it. Okay. Alistair, the other challenge you had, I know, talking to your mate, was that, you know, COVID and the hospital business, geez, they did not go together well. They weren't good for each yeah, other. No, we, we were hammered and we're still being hammered. The, but the you're working hard, mate, back. aren't you? You're, I mean, you're back in business. You didn't go under. Um, what is no, we didn't go under, but we're not making money, and not, nor is a lot of hospo. But there are pockets. Um, you know, hospo has bounced back. People want to go out again, and it's we're, we're social beings, and a hospo is required for part of our society and our community. And it's also a safe place to drink, as opposed to drinking unchecked at home or... Um, outside of licensed premises. Licensed premises is, is the best way to drink because we're trained to handle um, and uh, people who are drinking and their behaviours uh, and the behaviours towards each other. So uh, it's definitely part of society. So HOSPO is bouncing back, there's no doubt about it. But the CBD of Wellington at, at our end of town, you know, from Parliament, Lambton Quay, uh, all that in a, in a city area, um, until you get to the periphery again, um, has not bounced back. And, and the, the, one of the main reasons for that is this um, unannounced government policy of work from home. So the government sector is um, it's now become entrenched. Um, so the government sector has ballooned, it's huge, and there is a change to the uh, microeconomy of New Zealand, um, which to the detriment of the Wellington CBD, the Golden Mile, the retail and all the um, hospo businesses and cafes, etc., in the middle of that CBD area are in you know, real trouble. All their models, business models, were predicated on pre-COVID. So that's their lease arrangements, uh, you, you, how much they pay in rent and all their uh, internal cost arrangements. So that, that's all had to be reconfigured. And of course, the profit's not there anymore because the sales aren't there anymore. That, that's the situation in the in the Wellington. And also, CBD. I'd say that Wellington Central Wellington has turned into a emergency housing centre for the crazies. Yep, yeah, that is a major problem. I mean, we've got a, a a different version of Rotorua on our hands. The best way um, to uh, ease the burden of that is to have lots of strong small business and sole traders doing their thing all the way around uh, Wellington and creating a vibrancy uh, via the market, via lots of small players in the market. What this government has been incredibly adept at doing is smashing out sole traders and small players from uh, the, the, especially the city microeconomies. And the same's happened in Auckland. Um, compliance is way too heavy. Um, they need to start facilitating small business to maintain their uh, CBD environments. And that, it's where people should want to go, not not stay out in the suburbs. They can become mini um, uh, microcosms of vibrancy as well, little mini towns out in the suburbs, sure. But the, the main city of, of Wellington should be the hub of everything. And to do that, you have to allow and facilitate um, strong small business. Mm. Boise, I've really appreciated your input over the over the year. And I think the main thing is we have had a media that has been based on intellectual and political elites 
And people on a practical level down at street level haven't had much of a go in our news media. Um, you're a very real person and I've appreciated your real input, as might I say of many listeners and readers uh, on the platform. I do have to ask you, what do you think of Invercargill? <laughs> I, as you know, I go, used to go for over a decade duck shooting in Gore. I, and um, I, I didn't hear your interview, but I, I love you when you lombast uh, people in situations. And, I, and I'm sure you gave them a... Well, Nobby a, a just got upset. That he, he got upset they'd been named the SHIT town in New Zealand. And his first comeback was, we're going to have a new shopping mall next February. I asked him if it would have an escalator and he hung up on me. <laughs> Well, what they got a city planners in there. I've done a bit of work on this, and you'll get an op-ed out of it over Christmas. Um, they've got to get away from these big, thick uh, solutions that require lots and lots of pipes and lots and lots of infrastructure. What they've got to get back to is getting vibrancy in the middle of their cities. Um, and that does include parking, because you st maybe the parking's a bit more expensive. But instead of making shopping malls and endless bloody um, uh, car parks and everything, get the um, more of the smaller players, the sole traders and yeah. the, the food shacks and the, and the interesting, funky, um, uh, you know, um, gourmet stuff going and provide uh, art, artistry and all of this sort of stuff and let it organically grow, but you've got to allow it to happen. The big infrastructure, all that's going to do is drive up rates. Because <laughs> like, yeah. you've got to feed the infrastructure with all the pipes forever. So you yeah. create the infrastructure, otherwise it becomes this white elephant, and then you get all the empty uh, industrial blocks that still have to have water, they still have to have sewerage, they have to have all the three waters. <laughs> so, I mean, I think the mayor of Invercargill, all of the um, cities of New Zealand have to take a look at themselves because this rates thing is just another massive squeeze on business. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and this is another problem with the Wellington CBD. Our rates are way too high for business. Yeah. Building owners, uh, they can pay, like, say if they're paying 250000 in rates in the Wellington CBD, they could go to, like, Mount Eden in Auckland and pay 80000 They pay 50000 just in transport rates, and now they're going to lose car parks. So they keep the car parks, but make the city more walkability-friendly so, you know, yeah. people like you and me can do our pub crawls, no problem. <laughs> go, go to the, our favourite food eateries and shop in boutique yeah. stalls as well as um, a, a, as well as larger shops um, and get the access, accessibility going for everyone. But but don't cut off your nose to spite your face. face. Okay, Boise, I want to run through. Who is your politician of the year? Uh, Nicola Willis. Yeah, Nicola Willis, okay. Yeah. So she's the quiet achiever. She's the glue in, in the pack. Yeah, uh, she she'll bring it all together. And close second is David Seymour. David okay. Seymour uh, is a policy guru. He comes up with an answer to absolutely everything and an alternative to everything, and he just doesn't stop. He's like the Energizer Bunny, and he makes sense. Okay, crap politician of the year. Uh, it's our prime minister. Really, don't find anything redeeming about it. Uh, she put on the overseas stage. You know, let her have some kudos that. Uh, if she can go out and sell New Zealand and, and get um, our international trade going, maybe, maybe she could do a bit more of that and help, help, instead of decimating our rural sector, is promote it and even enhance it and get the sales going. I mean, she, she is um, sort of well-renowned. Uh, hence, they had a major shock with her recent uh, floor calling um, Seymour a, um, a prick. Yeah. <laughs> Arrogant prick, yeah, yeah. Um, all but, uh, right, what do you yep. think were the themes of this year, politically and news-wise? Well, what, what was the thing that grabbed you or had you most interested, like, you know, freedom of speech or co-governance or what? Well, I, I definitely think that the divisive nature of this government and co-governance is the is the, um, the the real buzz. That's the one that's going to bring them down, and that's the one that New Zealanders just will not countenance, and they won't expand on it. They don't actually have a... Um, they haven't articulated what they believe it is or where it's going, so we can only imagine. And the peers' co-governance has stemmed right into the heart of the Cabinet. So you've got your um, Mahuta, Kelvin Davis, um, Willie Jackson um, part of co-governance, and then you've got your uh, David Parker, Grant Robertson... Um, uh, 
on the other side. So we've already got a co-governance going on within the cabinet. So Mahuta seems to be able to do whatever she likes with impunity. Um, so, but that, for, for me, it's um, unfortunately it's uh, a government um, failing to, to heed, heed and listen to the will of the people. Uh, and that will be to their detriment in the election, from what I can see. You're going to have a busy old year. There'll be lots of people visiting Wellington. Um, oh, I love it. I mean, it's gross for the mill for me. You know, like, I can't get enough of the, the political side, and uh, uh, I, I absolutely adore commentating on it and um, getting involved in it. It's, uh, it's uh, brilliant, and it's so important that people do and that they understand the real issues, and that co-governance is a real issue. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with you. Yeah. Are, you break, Are you getting yeah, a break, Boise? Are you getting away? Yeah, I certainly am. I've got... Um, 10 days with the family up in Havelock North, uh, just on New Year. It takes me a few days to break down the pub, break down the kitchen. We'd shut and reopen on the 16th of January. That's the day and, we're uh, back, boys. We might, do a, we might do a little cross, see how the Christmas oh, holidays to. were. Look at the family yeah, yeah, stamps yeah, and, and the slideshow. Yeah. <laughs> get a whole lot of kids in get tell some stories yeah. play some games Yeah. Um, look, <laughs> as I said Boise thank you very much indeed it's been great to reconnect in a more meaningful way this year and your hospitality yeah, look, um, too has been great yeah sure I just want to say that I think the platform has rebalanced media in New Zealand uh, and anyone can, the, the left wing are, are absolutely scared of you I know you have your uh, detractors of the anti-vax movement. It's only because they want you so much to represent them. Uh, but the platform has um, allowed opinion. It's done what you set out to do, and I really hope it carries on and goes from strength to strength because I, I think well, it's wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. And as I say, thank you for your help. We will uh, catch up in the new year, Boise. Go well. Take care. See you in 2023. Brilliant. Cheers, Sean. Cheers, buddy. That is Alistair Boyce, Boyce from the backbench at David, who just organically has become a little bit of a friend of the platform, which is lovely. And as I say, I was down at his pub uh, last evening uh, for a bit of an aftermatch after, a, uh, actually, strangely, a really good funeral um, for John Armstrong, former political editor of The Herald, and a fine, fine journalist, and also, as you find at a funeral, a fine, fine father and friend. And his son, uh, his son Tim, spoke beautifully of his father, uh, Tim, in his mid-twenties. Um, and it takes a lot to do that at a funeral. And uh, Tim, I don't know, you're probably not a platform listener, but uh, great admiration for you. And I wish you and your family well as you go uh, forward uh, without John. Um, Sean, Jacinda will be fine next year. So she's featuring on Ginger and Winger's ne- next, next Netflix series. Is she really? Oh, she is. What? Is she going to be in it? They meet her or something? No, so I'm just briefly reading about it so I can't tell you too much, but there's going to be a Netflix series out next year which feature ha- Harry and Meghan as well as Jacinda and Greta Thunberg, or however you say it. Oh, Jesus H. Christ. Going on about the wonderful Christ. leadership of those oh, people. Well, see, this is the thing. There's domestic consumption and there's overseas consumption. Mm. And, you know, according to the rest of the world, Jacinda Ardern walks on water. Yeah. But yeah. Netflix, you know, you don't have to watch it, I guess. you got to pay to see it. Yeah, that's true, Netflix. Uh, mind you, I, look, we have, we've hardly mentioned Ginger, uh, Harry and Megan, have we? Ginger and, and Winger? Or Ginger and Winger, yeah. I that's like what that name. Harry and Sad. Megan, Ginger and Winger. That was yeah. in the Pleasant Point Christmas Parade. There you go. There you go. You've got to keep up. Um, and um, and I haven't talked about that or Jeremy Clarkson and the Clark because it's all just online Twitter bloody outrage. And it means nothing to the real lives of New Zealanders, which is why people like Boise are important to me because we are essentially a New Zealand organisation. We are a New Zealand media organisation. We talk about New Zealand. I was online the other day and someone said, what do you, what do you think about what's happening or do you know what's happening in Peru? And I said, no, because I'm not in Peru. Oh, and they said, oh, great journalism there. I'm not a Peruvian bloody journalist. You read a Peruvian news site if you want to know what's happening in Peru. And I don't need to go around reading and say, I know what's happening in Peru, as if it makes me any smarter. I'll write and think about New Zealand and broadcast about New Zealand because that's where journalism begins. It begins at home. All right? Unless you're some sort of Ponzi varsity train wanker. 
in my humble, humble opinion.